Hello, everyone. My name is Alex. I'm the secretary for the 36th District Democrats, and we're here today to interview uh, Todd Curtis for the Port for the Port Commissioner of Seattle position. Um, Mr. Curtis, if you would please like to introduce yourself. Oh, certainly. I'm Todd Curtis. I'm running for the Port of Seattle Commission, uh, position number five. I'm a uh, first-time candidate, but a very long-time uh, resident of the 36th. I've uh, been living there since uh, 1992. And uh, not too far from Co, where my uh, son went to school uh, in elementary school. And I wanted to bring to the port uh, my experience in transportation, which is uh, stretching back several decades from my time as a flight test engineer in the Air Force to my time at Boeing in the 1990s, early 2000s, where I specialized in aviation safety related issues. And that's the place where I had my first exposure to policy issues across a broad range of uh, participants in that in order to get that job done across the industry, uh, one had to interact with a whole lot of different kinds of folks with a whole lot of different kinds of uh, uh, needs. And that sort of thing is what attracted me even years ago to considering the Port of Seattle, because it is such an important transportation hub, not just for this region, but for the nation as a whole. But more importantly, what I wanna bring is an attitude of uh, collaboration with a wide range of, of people and dealing with and tackling some very challenging issues when it comes to workforce development, uh, keeping jobs in the community for people in the community to, to work and continue to live in Seattle, dealing with ongoing climate impacts, both from past activities and future activities, and also uh, helping to guide the port toward a future where it's sustainable economically sustainable from an e ecological point of view, and also uh, becomes a help for the region to develop further and become a more attractive place for people to live, work, and play. Thank you so much for that introduction. We really appreciate it. Uh, now we will go on to the questions portion of the night, and I will pass it on to uh, Shep, who is in charge of asking our first question. Yeah. Um, gates at the new international terminal at SeaTac were not designed to be large enough for the intended planes. How did this happen, and how you will, will you prevent this sort of problem from occurring on future projects? Well, how any problem like this happens in an infrastructure situation in an airport is usually one of a vision. That is, uh, if you plan today for something that might be built 5, 10, 15 years from now, one has to take into account what airlines are doing right now with respect to how they plan to serve that, that area and what kind of equipment, what kind of technology is going to be available in the future. Uh, for example, um, just this past year or so, Boeing stopped producing the 747, which had been produced for over 50 years. And there's nothing on the horizon that big. And if you had planned 10 to 15 years ago thinking, well, what kind of airplanes would be uh, at this port or at this new terminal? One might have assumed that there would be a lot of uh, very large aircraft around, but the reality is it's not. So how can you prevent something like this in the future? One has to keep a very close eye on trends, not just technological trends, but business trends. And business trends could mean, is there going to be a huge influx and a huge increase in members of the middle class at, in a market that might want to fly to Seattle? Uh, 40 or 50 years ago, if you had said that China would be the largest aviation market in the world. Some people might have looked at you uh, and said, how can that possibly be? But yet here we are. 20 years from now, whatever picture exists now will be different from what will be existing 20 years from now. And it's important that any decision maker at any level, at the airport, at the Department of Transportation, at airlines, uh, look ahead and make uh, appropriate changes to deal with possibilities. In the case of the international terminal at SeaTac, um, that process led to a situation where it's less than optimal. 10 seconds. And looking ahead and thinking ahead is the way I would approach avoiding that in the future. Thank you so much for that answer. I will now pass it over to Toby, who I believe is asking the second question. Much of the port's core economic activities cause huge externalities and other environmental impacts, especially on low-income immigrant and BIPOC communities. 
How do you propose to make the port less damaging to the environment and more economically, economically equitable? Well, those are uh, difficult challenges, but they have to be met. Uh, frankly, there are people who rely on the airport for their livelihood, and many of them who are in the lower economic uh, strata of society have very few choices with respect to where they live or how they get to and from the airport. So one of the very basic things I would look at to make that part of their experience better is, how are they getting to and from the airport? As simple as that. Are they being given the public transit options that make it easy for them to get there? Well, one thing that uh, stands out is the light rail, which is an excellent system, but if you stop at the terminal, it's, I don't know, 1,500 steps or so to get to the terminal. Is this something that is being repeated when it comes to how the workers get to the airport? Are they being treated fairly when it comes to that? Also, when it comes to the effects on local communities, uh, whether it's aircraft, trucks going to and from the port, et cetera, if these are things that are under the control of the port, can they reduce the amount of traffic, especially on the ground, that goes through these communities? Can they put incentives in place to make it less noisy, something as simple as that? Uh, electrification is something that's uh, coming on strong, even for large trucks. And as that becomes cheaper and easier to use, I think that'll be uh, more popular across the board. Can the port do something to provide incentives so that the port itself and its partners, as much as possible, have fewer impacts on the environment? And certainly, when there have been demonstrated situations where port activities and of their partners has and continues to negatively impact how people live, then steps should be taken. And, and the port should take an active role in that and to encourage other organizations, other uh, political organizations to get involved in that aspect as well. Thank you so much. You. I will now pass it on to our third question asker who I believe is Jazz. Uh, the, sorry about the noise in the background. Uh, the Green Cruise Corridor may, have been, may eventually reduce the enormous climate impact of cruise ships, but science tells us what we need uh, that we need to reduce emissions now. How will you measure life cycle greenhouse gas emissions by the whole Alaska cruise route by next year? And will you ensure zero emissions are achieved by uh, 2040? Well, measuring the uh, total emissions of any system, uh, especially one that stretches thousands of miles, will need the help of other entities. The Port of Seattle has a limited reach when it comes to that, but certainly between the authorities in Canada and Alaska and the state of Washington and the U.S. federal government, there's probably enough information out there to have a good chance at getting a reasonable estimate of what the pollutants are. And rather than, than re, um relying on the producers of that, the cruise lines themselves, I think the port should make an effort to independently get that information. Now, as far as ensuring zero emissions, uh, that isn't uh, the ultimate goal. If there are zero emissions, that would be acceptable, acceptable all around. How we get there, step by step, it could start as simple as, are there places right now where there's technology in existence that can be put into place to keep pollutants from happening? Something as simple as making sure all the ground support uh, equipment at ports have zero or low emissions options. Uh, drawing power from green sources and pumping that electrical power into the ships rather than having them have the generators uh, going off uh, in populated areas is another way of doing that. And certainly uh, there are changes happening in the cruise industry similar to what happens in the aviation industry in that as time goes on, and it becomes clear to those who are running these ships that going green is the way to go. Then if there are options out there for them to move however slowly towards zero emissions, and they're not moving in that direction, they should be uh, sanctioned. They shouldn't be allowed to get away with it. And in my personal opinion, uh, doing things like carbon offsets might, on the whole, have a net zero impact on the environment. But it'll Ten be seconds to reduce the, the environmental impacts at the source using whatever means are available. Thank you. And now, oops, sorry about that. And now over to our last question of the night, I will pass it over to Judy.
Sorry, are you going to put the question in the chat so I can see it? Uh, the question is already in the chat, Judy. Oh, I see. I, okay, I'm sorry. I was looking at the last one. Hi, uh, the truckers who transport containers to and from the port are independent contractors and low wage workers. These workers often cannot afford trucks that are low polluters. As a, a port commissioner, what will you do to address the low wages of these workers? And what will you do to address the pollution emitted by the trucks these drivers are using? One of the first things I would do to address this is understand the needs and the issues of those who are driving the trucks. That is, we might generally know that they're low wage and have a difficulty uh, financing or getting better equipment, but it would be best if we had a much more comprehensive idea of what the problem is and what part of it could be addressed by the port or by state and local authorities. Also, since uh, uh, truck transportation is very, very heavily dependent on federal regulations, I'd look to the federal government to see what kinds of regulations have been applied and whether they have been applied unfairly in a way that makes it difficult for these truckers to have the kind of equipment and kind of options that would be preferable. Also, with the recent passage of some of the legislation in Washington that gives all sorts of incentives for people, for companies to move toward greener kinds of transportation, I would look at what kind of options are out there and are the truckers who are here locally aware of what those are who they have to talk to at the federal or state level, and how they can get on board with having tax subsidies or other kinds of incentives and help in order for them to move forward. Uh, the independent trucking uh, community is an important part of the community. These are people who live and work in this area. And it's, a, it's important that the port, port do its bit to help not only the big companies, which have the resources to take advantage of all this, but also the smaller independent contractors, bringing them on board into the decision process so they understand through directly or through their representatives just what kind of challenge exists and what their role can be in helping us help them, I think will be important. And uh, the more that can be done, the more information that can be gotten directly from the truck seconds. and the more that the port can help them get to a better place will be better for the entire community. Thank you so much, Todd. That is it for our scripted questions. And now our eWord members will be able to ask uh, follow-up questions. As a reminder, you have one minute to answer these follow-up questions. And I see Jeremy has his hands up. So Jeremy, feel free to ask your question. Um, you mentioned in the answer to your first question um, that you would use forecasts that look at all sorts of different economic and um, economic conditions and, and things that will be happening in the future. Um, I think one thing that we've, I know we've seen over the past few decades is sometimes some of those forecasts can be overly optimistic or pessimistic. For an example, one of them, if you look at uh, the forecast of number of cars traveling over the Ballard Bridge, it keeps going up and the actual number has stagnated. Um, so one I know that I know we've seen thrown around a lot is the an estimate of the of increase needs for air travel in Washington state and that we will need a second commercial airport in Western Washington. When you look at a forecast like that, how do you assess if it's valid? And well, I would look at this from several perspectives. For example, very basically, what were the assumptions made in this model? If the assumptions are taking into account things that simply aren't there or are not realistic, then that would say to me that not necessarily it's an invalid model, but a model where you would have to look at low, middle, and high ranges of projected traffic to see what would have to be done in those uh, particular options. For example, with respect to, is there a need for another airport in the Puget Sound area? Well, there might be increased traffic, but can increased traffic be handled only by another airport or can it be done by changing air traffic control, which is beyond the local control, or by considering uh, repurposing airports that are largely general aviation or even military and changing them into something that can offload some of the pressure on airports. And again, uh, when it comes to these assumptions, you have to question the assumptions and then go forward. Shep, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask a follow-up question to a number one 
too. Um, I've never been involved in building an airplane terminal, so I have no idea what's involved there. But it would strike me that there must have been ongoing plan review or some kind of attention paid to what the final thing was going to look like and the airplanes that were going to kind of move in uh, shortly after it's built. So I, I'm kind of, the, the, at least I, I had some input into that question. And what I'm really trying to understand is how does it happen that some that somebody isn't making an adjustment somewhere along the line, either the contractors or the port or the design review at the port to see, okay, this isn't gonna work. How do we fix it before it's unfixable? And that's really what I was trying to kind of ask about how, how you would handle that kind of a problem. And I'm sure that will come up again. Well, the best way to handle a problem like that is to anticipate the potential pitfalls that are happening ahead of time. And as you mentioned, there might be several very different organizations involved in the same process coming to the same conclusion, but they would have different incentives for what sort of approach they would take. And again, that's a situation where uh, bringing in uh, outside experts if needed who have done this sort of large-scale planning for large-scale terminals around the world. Um, there is nothing unique about an airplane going into a terminal. That is, it's the very same equipment, very same procedures, very same airlines in many cases. There is knowledge out there that if it were brought to bear on the situation, all the major players involved in the SeaTac situation might have had a better insight as to what direction to take, might have built more flexibility into the design seconds. to take into account the things that might, that might happen in the future. Toby, you have your hand up. Yes, I do. Uh, my follow-up question concerns the tension between you as an elected official that has responsibility and the port staff who do the day-to-day -day decision making. And an example that came to mind is if the regional studies of transportation needs indicate that high-speed rail could relieve the need for uh, airport run another airport, how would you address the pressure from inside to have another airport instead of just capitalizing the rail? Well, the, the, those kinds of pressures are unavoidable. And you, when you have an elected or an appointed official over a professional staff that will be there long after that particular official has moved on down the line. And that's where looking at the uh, way things have, have been done in the past to find what has worked define where the areas of leverage are for an elected official is important to deal with that. Whether you're talking about transportation alternatives or other alternatives when it comes to large scale in infrastructure, the key thing here, it's going to be happening over years. And perhaps the best an elected official can do is to ensure that whoever is going to make the final decision years down the line starts with the foundation of facts, data, and approaches that has been shown to work consistently in other contexts and could work here in the Seattle area. Thank you so much. We have time for one more question. So Judy, please go ahead. Uh, yes, um, something has been said about these uh, outdated well, I hate to use that term, these highly polluting trucks. And I'm wondering about the possibility of, say, of a rail system that goes directly down to where the container ships are unloaded and unloading the containers onto, directly onto the rails and eliminating those polluting trucks. And obviously, we'd have to find something else for those people to do. But I'm wondering about uh, thinking of alternatives to those highly polluting trucks. I believe, I is there a rail that goes down uh, to the docks now at some points? Could this, if so, could this be expanded? What well, could you do to, to get rid of those? What could you do to get rid of those trucks? Well, the, the one thing that comes to mind in a situation like this is similar to what happens in transporting people with, with mass transit, the last mile problem. That is, you might have a fantastic rail system or a fantastic system of some kind, but how do you get 
the object or the people from where they started to that particular system. There are a number of ports around the world that have extremely uh, well-developed, well-thought-out systems. My approach would be to look at what are the best practices around the world and which of these ports have a combination of technologies and procedures that would not only work in the ports in the Port of Seattle, but would also uh, um, achieve the goal of reducing noise and uh, tailpipe pollution from, from those vehicles. Uh, this is something that, that there are many solutions that are possible. My approach would be to find the one that seems to be the best one, the best fit for what's happening here. Thank you. Thank you so much for those thoughtful questions, Todd. That brings us to the end of our um, of our interview. Uh, the eBoard will be scheduling interviews with other candidates for your position if they have not occurred already.